everyone! My name is Cammie Williams and I'm a developer advocate for Facebook Open Source. Have you ever asked yourself, hey, I want to get into machine learning. How do I get started? What do I need to know first? And then after doing a quick internet search, you start to ask yourself, what are neural networks? Reading further, what is gradient descent? What is training bias? What is backpropagation? After asking yourself all these questions, you might then think, should I just give up and go get a PhD in machine learning? And with ML, it is pretty easy to fall down that rabbit hole. There are a lot of great community resources that can help you learn what neural networks are, learn about artificial intelligence, all of the algorithms behind that, but that's not what this video is. This video is for the programmer who looks at tech docs or readmes and skips all the words, just copies code blocks and hits run, hoping that it will work. This video is for the person who just likes to experiment learn something new, and then move on to the next cool thing. We're in luck because there are fortunately a lot of community resources out there that give you data sets, pre-trained models, and more at your disposal. So that way integrating ML into your application is actually a breeze. So I'm going to showcase how to find those tools and libraries and use one of them to make a fun little hack. This is intended to be an experiment. I haven't actually done any of the pre-coding for this, so Fingers crossed that it actually works, but I want to show you that it can actually be easy to integrate these highly technical concepts that you might not be familiar with into your application. So what am I going to make today? I have something in my head. Essentially, I want to make an iSpy app kind of where I'm going to give my computer an image and then I'm going to say I am thinking of something that is green and the computer will come back with different options based upon what is in the image that are green. I'll say yes or no and then hopefully eventually it'll find what I am thinking of. So if that sounds interesting to you, let's get started programming. I'm going to be using PyTorch for this hack. If you'll notice, I tried to match my hat with the website. Um, that was as close as I could get. Uh, but on PyTorch, we have this cool section of the website called the ecosystem. Now the ecosystem is essentially a showcase of those community resources. You can find more projects that are made by community members in the PyTorch forums. Sometimes there are blogs about them, but for now I'm going to just show you the ecosystem. So there are different models that you can discover, publish, reuse. Models are neural networks. It's just another word for neural networks. All all of this is to say if you don't want to write your own neural network or if you don't want to curate your own data set and write a model for it you can use this to discover different ones so they have many and this list is growing so if you're interested in starting from here take a look at this page the other part of the ecosystem is the tools and libraries section these tools and libraries are here to support accelerate and explore AI development some of these tools are useful if you are building your neural network. Some are useful if you are pushing your neural network to production. It's a plethora of different projects that help you at various points in your ML development. I highly recommend taking a look at all of these and just reading through, if anything, to discover something new. The one that I'm going to use today, though, is Detectron 2. Now, Detectron 2 is Facebook AI's research next generation software system that implements state-of-the-art object detection algorithms. It is a ground-up rewrite of the previous version Detectron and originates from this thing. Um, so all of that is to mean if you're a visual learner like me, Detectron 2 does this. So basically you can give it an image, it detects the objects in the image, and what's nice about it is that it not only gives you the objects, the accuracy of the prediction, um, but it also gives you the bounding box and the mask of the object. So I can get the exact line of the object detection, which is cool. Without reading all about Detectron 2, I'm just going to jump right into this Quick Start Colab notebook. Colab, if you're unfamiliar, um, it's a service by Google. It's basically a runnable notebook where you can run Python. It's very similar to Jupyter notebooks. I mean, using runnable notebooks is pretty standard in ML development, especially on the research side. Side. So I'm just going to click on the quick start. It is the beginner tutorial. It shows you how to get started with the Tektron 2, gives us a sample image, and then the detection of objects in that sample image. There are other parts of the tutorial that might be interesting to you. You can see that they use custom data sets with balloons. What I want to do is make a copy of this notebook so that way I can just have it for reference, but I'll do my actual hacking in the notebook. 
Okay, so now I have my copy. I'm just going to rename this my spy hack. We'll just call it that for now. Okay, so one of the great things about Colab is that you can change the runtime. I always make sure to look at the runtime before I run any of my ML code. Right now we're on hardware accelerator GPU. If you're on a laptop, chances are you have CPU. If you don't know what CPU, GPU, or TPU is, a lot of it just comes down to speed of running code. CPU stands for Central Processing Unit, GPU stands for Graphics Processing Unit, TPU stands for Tensor Processing Unit. I almost always run on GPU. Sometimes I run on TPU, but GPU is fine for what we're going to do. We're not doing any real heavy lifting here. I'm just going to delete the stuff that I know I don't need, which is a lot of the text. And what's nice about using a runnable notebook is you can run all of these code blocks independently. You can move them around. It really helps with experimenting because you can take a look at things that you've previously done. Um, you can easily replace or find things um, and see the output as the code runs. So it's great for debugging for obvious reasons. For now, I'll just show you how this first section runs. So we're going to just hit the installs first. This is installing Torch Torch Vision, Detectron 2 for me. It takes a minute, so I'm going to pause the video and then come back when it's finished installing. Okay, so mine just finished. You can see we have all of the outputs here. Just to clean up my window, I'm gonna just delete what those look like, but these have been run and you can tell that they've been run because of the one and two next to them. That just shows that we ran it. So then we have our imports. So we ran those imports. Next, we are going to get an image from the Coco data set. We're utilizing the Coco data set in this sample. If you run a read more up on it, it's essentially a large data set that helps with object detection. Next, we're going to be running some Detectron 2 code here. Um, and ultimately, you can see we end up with a default predictor. Now, again, it's up to you to read up on this, but I do think that it is important to reference this part of the Detectron 2 tech doc. So under Quick Start, you can see they have a link to the documentation. It creates a simple end-to-end -end predictor with the given config that runs on a single device for a single input image. So it essentially gives us the prediction for the input image, and once we call it, it gives us an output of the model for that single image. Okay, so we, we can see that we're doing that here. We're creating predictor based upon our config, and then we're getting the outputs from that predictor. Now, what does the outputs look like? We have a link here. It's also linked in the tech docs under C use models. Uh, but the model gives us all of this information. So the probably most prevalent ones are in instances. This is where we can get the information for the bounding box, um, the classes, which is like the labels, what the object actually is labeled as. So that could be person, that could be umbrella, whatever the mask, so that is the specific outline of the image, and then key points. What does that actually mean? I'm quickly going to print what output instance predicted classes looks like. You can see it just gives us an array of numbers. Now these numbers represent indexes of those labels. How do we get those labels? You can see in the visualizer it's linked here. I did a little bit of pre-reading on the docs to figure out how, but it is in this metadata catalog. For me to access what each of these indexes mean, you can see that we're in a tensor. I'm just gonna do four data in this output predicted classes. So I want access to these tensors really quick, so I'll just show you how to do that. Again, this is me just knowing a little bit about tensors, but the operations performed on tensors are very self-explanatory. So doing tensor at zero, you can see we get 17 in a tensor still. And then to get that actual integer, you just do dot item. And now you can see we have 17. In this for loop, I'm just going to do for data in outputs predicted classes. Uh, I'm going to set the number equal to data dot item. And then I am going to print according to that metadata catalog that at num. So now you'll be able to see by running this, oops, oh, metadata does not support indexing. Wait. Oh, okay. Got it. So first, let me again 
just quickly print this out so you can see what it looks like. I think I have to do dot train classes or think classes. Yeah. So the thing classes again gives us all of the categories. So I have to do metadata catalog at thing classes at num and now that should work. Yeah. Okay, great. So you can see in this image, we have a horse, a person, a person, a person, a person, umbrella, and so on. So now we have all of these objects, which is great. We can see it's visualized here just by hitting run. This will take a minute, but we have the bounding boxes. We have the masks. We're doing a great job. And we can use all of this information to our benefit. This is pretty much all of the ML side of things that I want to do. So like I said, I'm going to write my hack in the collab. And again, I want to be able to input a um, color. Let's say I spy something brown, the computer to take a look at all these objects to understand what the overwhelming color is in that object bounding box. And then return back to me a guess of, okay, in this image, the horse is brown and um, you know, the ground is brown, but it, in this case, maybe it will give me back horse and then I'll say if that's right or wrong. If it's right, then great, we won. If it's wrong, then it'll give me another guess. Hopefully that all makes sense. I'm not gonna make like a web or mobile app front end for this. I'm just going to do it in the collab for sake of time. But if you're interested in seeing me connect a front end to this code, just leave a comment down below and maybe I'll make a part two to this video. I'm going to just quickly delete these outputs for my own visibility. So I'm going to create a function that inputs, let's say an image and a color as a string. The computer outputs a guess, which is the string name of the object that matches that color. And then just kind of a little bit of logic behind this. I'll have the color equate to an RGB, let's say. I'll have to have some kind of generalization of colors. So it, let's say something is like light green or dark green, just have that all match to green. I'm going to input image, detect objects and masks. Then with the mask, I am going to generalize color. So image in mask, generalize the color, match the color to the generalization of colors up here. Then see if there are any matches from the input color to the colors of available that we found. If yes, output the object name and image with mask around that single object. If no, output all object instances in image and say, I don't know, give me another color. How about? So now let's just start from here. Maybe we'll move forward and create like that back and forth dialogue. Yes, that's this. No, it's not this. But for now, let's just start with this function and see how long it takes um, to just do this. Now I'm going to create a function. We'll just call it spy, oops, spy, spy the color. We'll input the color, which is our string and then the image. Okay. So now this is where some stellar grade A programming comes in and I'm going to do a Google search on if any of this logic already exists because hey, if I don't have to reinvent the wheel, that's awesome. One of the many, many benefits of open source. So I know that in Python you can use PIL to help you, you know, find that color generalization. I just want to see if I can then take that RGB that I get and then also have it match to say like a string of green or red or magenta or whatever, maybe like web safe colors. So let's just do a quick little search on that. Okay. So I'm back. I managed to get a solution. Um, the answers I got were from this GitHub uh, 
user who created a solution about eight years ago to get the color of an image. And then also this Stack Overflow answer, which is also eight years old, that uses this package called Web Colors. So install Web Colors, I'm using it. Web Colors has a common error where if your RGB doesn't match to a web safe cover, it throws an error. Web safe color, it throws an error. So um, ultimately I had to utilize a function to match the RGB color from the list of colors to a web safe color. Um, and then give me my output. So right now I can do this. Uh, I just return that list of colors along with which one is the most dominant. So in my current input image, we can see that the most dominant color here is dim gray and the least dominant color is silver, which, you know, those are kind of similar, um, but it's fine because I'm going to keep going. This is again, getting the entire image. Ultimately, I want to get the dominant color in that mask. Again, what we were able to do is first get the color match and generalization of colors. Now we want to do it on, now we want to use Detectron 2 to detect the objects, then pull the masks out of the objects, perform this logic on each one, map each mask object to a color, and then output the label of that mask object. Sounds like a lot, but I think we're kind of, you know, getting to the easier part, hopefully, fingers crossed, because we're going to be using Detectron 2. Right now, copy in our Detectron 2 logic. So at this point, I'm just going to use this code a little bit more explicitly. Let me say that this is my color logic, and I'll just move it down there for now. But above that, I'll do my uh, Detectron 2 logic. So we have the predictor and then my outputs for my Detectron 2 image. So now I want to get those masks. So I'm converting them here to numpy arrays just so they're a little bit numpy, sorry, just so they're a little bit easier to iterate over. And then I'm also going to get the bounding boxes. So because we have multiple masks, multiple boxes, I'm going to split these out into some helper functions. So that way I don't have to worry about writing loops and kind of keeping track of my context here. The first helper function that I'm going to write is to get that image inside the mask. I'll take in the mask and the box, and then I need to take in the Detectron 2 image. So I'll do um, original image, we'll call it. So first I need to get the height and width of the mask. To do that, I'm just gonna quickly peep into what our outputs look like to provide a little bit of clarity here. So I'll just do the first index of the mask and the first index of the boxes. Okay, so the mask is just going to give us like falses and truths to where the pixels in the larger image are true for the mask. And then this box, it looks like it's just giving us some coordinates here. So, so it looks like the coordinates are probably the upper left and the lower right. That, that's my assumption. I'm going to quickly check the tech docs to make sure that's right. Cool. Yeah, so that was the case. So essentially, I am going to get the mask height and the max width, the mask width first from those bounding box um, coordinates. Okay, so now I have the true dimensions of the box, not just based on the main image, but based on it itself. So from here, you know, that's going to be like, um, again, 459 minus um, 126 to give me the width and then 480 minus 244 to give me the height. And I'm getting this so ultimately I can create this temp image of what is inside the mask and then get the main color from that temp image. And I'm going to create a NumPy array um, filled with zeros according to this height and width. So I can populate what of that box is mask versus is not mask. So now at this point, we should have a box that has the shape of the mask filled in black and white. 
just running the code in the helper function real quick that I've already written, you can see now we have this outline. I'll quickly print what temp mask looks like. So you can see that it's just a bunch of zeros and ones um, and it gives us this outline of an object. I can also change it. So let's say I want the 10th one. I think there are 10 objects here. There might not be. Yeah, so it, is, it looks like it might be an umbrella. And also just a quick side note, I'm using matplotlib in order to give me this um, image, this visualization. I imported it up here. Now I want to get all of the pixels that are white in this mask to now equal the RGB colors from the original image. Actually, uh, also point out that I renamed these variables so that way they were a little bit more intuitive to height and width. Um, okay, so now I want to be able to get the proper colors in this white area, but I also want to set black as transparent just so I don't get black as like the, the dominant color. And we will create a multi-dimensional numpy array and the value at the height width coordinate is going to be an array of size 4, meaning RGBA. So it'll the A will tell us if it is transparent or not. Now I'm going to iterate over the height and width from this uh, temp mask filled with the ints, giving us the zeros and ones. Height index, height, is it black or white? Width index, width black or white. If the width BW is equal to zero, 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 meaning it'll be just transparent black. Otherwise, otherwise it was a one. So I want to take my original image, which I put up here and get the pixel value at this spot in the original image. So I'm going to need to do a little bit of index manipulation there. So we have the original height, we have the original width. Now get the um, RGB, original RGBA and then append a one at the end. And now with all of that, this temp mask fill is going to equal original RGBA. Okay. okay, great. Now let's see what this looks like. If we just do M show this temp mask fill, I don't think it'll show up. Just give me the zero through three indices there. So um, width is fine, height is fine, but then here, give me zero to three. And we'll show that and great. So now we have this outline of the man. Okay, and then for this helper function, I'm just going to return this um, temp mask fill. So now I should just be able to do... So now our helper function works. We have this um, image that we created. So now in my main application, if you want to call it that, um, I just have to call that function. And then ultimately we'll create an array of masks, masks array dot append. Now we have the input image. We need to, we got the image in the mask. Now we need to generalize the color in that image. Again, for ease of reading, I quickly, um, I cut and I moved my helper functions up here. I'm going to convert these into helper functions as well, this identifying um, the most dominant color. So now we have helper functions for our color logic, our mask logic, and we can call it all in the spy the color. I can either save that image output from this mask logic locally, or can try and manipulate this to identify the colors. I think the latter will be easier. That kind of renders this logic a little bit useless because we have all of those, you know, RGBA colors now. So really all I need to use is this closest color function. The the problem is going to kind of be, you know, how do I how do I generalize the colors? I think I will attempt to do that now and we'll see what we come up with. Okay. So <laughs> it's been a while, but I managed to write a function that detects every single color in the image and it's not going well. Um, as you can see, you know, it outputs the color and then the count and there are basically 
thousands, if not potentially millions of unique colors in this image. So this isn't the right approach, but I want to show you how to, I, I want to show you how I did it regardless. So I used MP unique. Uh, axis zero essentially means, again, the row and column. So over each column, find all the unique colors. And then I have this track unique colors helper function where we dive into the unique colors. If it is our transparent color, ignore it. Otherwise, see if it already exists in the colors that we're tracking. Um, if it already exists, then just update the count of that color, which happens here. Otherwise, um, append it to append it as a new color with its count and then return. So, like I said, it's it's pretty much all unique colors. So I have to find a way, um, just so that way I don't run out of space and it goes faster to somehow generalize the colors first before I start to track these unique colors. It was a relatively easy find. Um, image quantize. This function converts image P mode with the specified number of colors. So after messing with image quantize, I figured that I actually do need to save this mask of the image that we were able to get and i can use that pillow quantize so i saved it just as geeks this was just the variable from the tutorial but you can see the original image here and then when i open geeks um, you can see the quantize image which essentially means that the colors are more combined you know the manipulation with the transparent color uh, unfortunately i can't really use it because this image overlay only works with CV2. So what I'll need to do is to go back to my helper function up here, do that. I'll write this as the temp before quantize, and then we can do temp after quantize. We save it. We'll return quantized put this around it for extra measure. I'll just have this return right now. Just print this output. Great. So let's see what that looks like. Yay! Great. Okay. Awesome. Okay. So now we have this quantized image. Let's see if my tracking unique colors logic works on it. Actually, this should pretty much run, hopefully. Let's just see. Um, yeah, wow, that was a lot faster. Currently, as it stands, prints out every iteration of all colors, but um, if I just move that out to here, all colors, there should be only a total of 10. Great. And you can see that the instance of black is largest. Let's move this helper function up, and then we, we should really quickly create another helper function here. Get all colors. Wow, I'm so pleased that that is so much faster. You don't even know. I was waiting for a really long time for that other um, helper function to run. So then here we just return all colors. Just make sure that this works. Print get all colors. My inputs here are the RGBA list. So print get all colors. So let's set this equal to colors in image really quick. And then this goes for each color and count. Okay. And then we'll, we'll print the list colors in image. Let's see if this works. Oh, okay. So I need to convert this numpy array to just be the RGB string. Create an RGB format. Yeah. Now let's try it. Perfect. Lavender, black, dark, gray. I see red, but whatever. Let's just keep going and then we can debug. So I'll just redo this function, colors and image. So we'll take in the RGBA list, return list colors and images. What have we done? We uh, generalized the color. 
we match the color to a generalization of colors. Now we have to see if there are any matches from the input color to all of the colors available that we found. We need to get to the most popular color, which this list isn't sorted. Okay, so I managed to do this um, based on a sorting algorithm I found here. This essentially short sorts my list in ascending order according to the second index of the tuple. And then black is almost always the largest color because again of that mask. So I just pop the last index if it is black and then return. And then I ran it down here and it works. So this means that our most major color in this image is that medium slate blue, which I actually think it's probably red. I just have an error somewhere, but that's fine. Now, for each mask that appears, I want to get a list of all of the major colors. Okay, so now we should have a list of all of our dominant colors. Let's just run that and test. So this will give us a list of all of the dominant colors of the masks. No, no, too many values. Oh, okay, so we need to enumerate simple easy errors here. <laughs> Medium slate blue is pretty popular. Now is the time where we need to do some debugging. So red is 255.00. It's kind of hard to tell what here matches that color. I'm, I'm wary that they might be backwards. Because like, yeah, I think they're backwards because this color backwards matches here, which is like a burgundy. So I'm just going to do two and zero and let's see. Black, brown, slate gray, dim gray, rosy brown, antique white, dark slate gray, Indian red, tomato. That sounds right. Okay, great. Now <laughs> let's run the spy the color logic. And we have all of our top colors, so it's a lot of gray. Yeah, it's a lot of gray. <laughs> but we do have a tomato for one of them. So now I want to go through this list of dominant colors, and if the dominant color matches this, then return the object that we think it possibly could be. We'll call it selected item, and then the selected item index color, let's see, color and count. If color is equal to the, we'll call this requested color, how about, then selected item. Now we need to get the index of this tuple, which I've done before. Let me just find it really quick. I believe that that was up here, yeah. If the tuple is the requested color, then we want these indices. So then the selected item index is equal to indices at zero. Out here, we'll do if selected item is equal to nothing. Selected item, we is going to equal the metadata catalog dot training set dot thing classes get this selected item index from the classes to m class is equal to great. And then that should give us an integer else return. Okay, let's see what this looks like. So I'm going to spy the tomato. I spy something of the color tomato. Is it the tomato person? Yep, it is. <laughs> okay, uh, so now we just need to show the image of it outlining that person. It's been a minute, I've been reading the visualizer docs. I couldn't figure out the mask to select one image, but I did figure it out for boxes and labels. So with spy the color, if you're searching for tomato in this image and you hit run, 
puts a square around the thing it thinks it is and it says is it the tomato person um, and the way I did this was I just used this overlay instances function I selected the box of the output at the index that we found and then I added the label to it as well so that's essentially it we were able to create our own spy game according to a color using detect front 2 the colors are a little wonky but you know that would that would just take a little bit of cleanup work here we got colors to match to rgb generalization of colors on the detectron 2 side uh, we had the input image detect the objects and mask get the image of the mask generalize the color of the mask match the color to a generalization of colors that we made before see if there are any um, matches if yes we output the name and image with the mask around the single object we couldn't do that we ultimately did the bounding box and then if no i'll put all object instances and say i don't know give me another color we um ultimately said that color was not found and that's basically it and we were able to do all of this logic in our Google Colab with the Tektron 2. Okay, yeah, so that was a lot of fun. It was a lot of coding. It's much later than when I started, but hopefully you uh, managed to follow along if you were able to. If you did, thank you. Um, I appreciate you all having patience behind this and uh, letting me experiment with something interesting. Again, we, we were able to integrate machine learning into a relatively simple application with without touching any of the neural networks or data sets. You can take a look at the ecosystem that PyTorch offers or read more about what community members have made on the PyTorch forums or blogs as well. Thanks for sticking around. See you next time. My name is Cami Williams. Bye!